It had been 39 years since the world's best trod the turf of the Royal Liverpool Golf Club while competing for the Claret Jug. In 2006, they returned and produced an Open Championship well worth the wait. Welcome to Hoylake. For the 135th Open Championship. At the Royal Liverpool Golf Club. It was 1967 since we last hosted the Open. So we can't wait for the action to start. The Royal Liverpool Golf Club, also known as Hoylake, shares its coast location with those other notable Open Championship venues, Royal Birkdale and Royal Litham and St Anne's. But unlike them, it had fallen out of the Open spotlight. Until, that is, the making of a momentous and popular decision to take the Open back to the glorious links. For the vast majority of the players who arrived with understandable anticipation for the 135th staging of the game's oldest major, it was their first experience of the course. But many were aware of the rich history surrounding the club that welcomed the first of its 11 Open Championships in 1897. The winner back then was Harold Hilton, a Royal Liverpool club member. A decade later, the champion was Arno Massey. When Hoylake staged its fifth Open, an American showman came good. That was Walter Hagen in 1924. And six years later, the great Bobby Jones won the second leg of his Grand Slam, otherwise known as the impregnable quadrilateral. Peter Thompson won his third consecutive Open in 1956, and Hoylake's most recent champion was Roberto de Vicenzo. The Argentine's emotional victory was achieved before many of the modern contenders were born, but that didn't prevent them from appreciating Royal Liverpool's hefty chapter in the annals of the game. Having it be part of Bobby Jones's Grand Slam is terrific, and, and having it be part of uh, Peter Thompson's three British Opens in a row, and David Chinzo. It was neat to know that these great players walked these fairways. Defending champion was also keen to supplement Hoylake folklore with his name. Following a heart-wrenching three months mourning the death of his father and mentor, Tiger Woods sought to honor the late Earl Woods with more success. There's not a day that I don't think I'll ever go through life without thinking about my dad. The bond that we've had transcended just a normal parent-child relationship. So anytime I go back to my basics and work on grip, posture, and stance, and even all those things that I, I learned from him, you know, I always think about the, those, those younger days. And being back at the Open had a special resonance for Woods, as his father liked nothing more than watching his son tackle the unique challenges supplied by traditional golfing terrain. On links golf courses, you have to use your imagination, create shots, and it presents so many different options. And he, he thoroughly enjoyed it and watching me go out there and hitting all these weird shots. Um, he always got a big kick out of that. There were genuine concerns that given such benign conditions, the course would be overpowered. But that opinion was not shared by those best qualified to judge, the players themselves. It's going to be really pure Lynx golf this week. I think the golf course is so well bunkered that even with these calm conditions, you're still going to be careful. It's a great golf course. With the intensity of the heat wave temperatures and the growing size of the galleries over the practice days, 6.30 on Thursday morning could not come soon enough. Welcome to day one. The Open Championship. The waiting is over. And the action begins. In what is always a tense and exciting day. For us all. There were thunderstorms overnight, but nothing could dampen the excitement felt by Chris Moore, the Royal Liverpool Club Secretary. With electrical activity not far away, the start of play was delayed for 30 minutes. But when you've waited 39 years, that was only a minor disruption. After Sweden's Peter Hedblom struck the initial shot, Chris was overjoyed and busy. His thoughts, predictable. 
as you can imagine, delighted that the championship has come back to Hoylake. It, it's been a marvellous four or five years since we know the championship has, has uh, re kind of returned to Hoylake. Um, and now that it's actually underway, it's absolutely wonderful to see so many of the top players walking our fairways after an absence which we regard as too long. My role now is, is to make sure that things are working in the way that they, the plans were set up, as well as interfacing with um, you know, the RNA, who bear the final responsibility for the event, uh, with the police on security matters. I'm pleased to say that most of my um, activities uh, have been completed now, and that, that was obviously the way I had hoped it would be. So I, I tend to um, float around uh, talking to people, making sure that they've got what they need, um, and obviously reacting to any emergency which may arise. We don't recognise the golf course much at the moment because of all the infrastructure, but the atmosphere, um, the goodwill, the enthusiasm of the members is very evident. It will be a great test for, um, for the top golfers of the world. Yeah, I think that, that it will pose questions. They will not simply be able to take a driver out and, and hit the ball wherever they wish. They will have to plot their way around. And uh, we should uh, end up with a great champion on a very fair test of golf. And those expectations were finally put to the test. And immediately, it became apparent that Hoylake would be no pushover. Trouble awaited errant shots, but birdies weren't in short supply either. Among the first taking advantage of greens softened by the storm, Miko Ilonen, the Finn who won the Millennium Amateur Championship on this very course six years earlier. The charismatic Spaniard Sergio Garcia was also finding the greens to his liking. Would Sergio be the first European to win a major since Paul Laurie's open triumph at Carnoustie in 1999? As the scoreboards began to fill, it became clear that while many were under par, no one was going to forge clear. Of course, not everyone prospered, but Colin Montgomery, second at St Andrews 12 months ago, was a surprise struggler the Scot didn't survive the halfway cut. Tiger Woods, Monty's conqueror around the old course, was favorite to retain possession of the claret jug. He played the first hole conservatively, a sign of things to come, but shocked all and sundry with an uncharacteristic three-putt bogey. While Tiger showed early vulnerability, home players were acquitting themselves with distinction such as the Englishman Anthony Wall, who served up a candidate for shot of the day with his second to the par 5 16th. Another was produced by Northern Ireland's Graham McDowell. highlight of a six under par round of 66. Coming down there today and seeing my name up there, it was, it's a lot of fun, you know, it's, you know, I know it's Thursday, but I just want to get it up there come Sunday, you know, and be able to enjoy myself coming down the last, that would be, that would be pretty nice. But all had one eye on Tiger, who despite his indifferent start and other stumbles along the way, refused to be flustered or grow impatient. Leaving the driver in the bag, Woods plotted his way round the fast-running course before causing alarm bells to ring on the 18th. An eagle three for a 67. On a day when a total of 32 players broke par, Tiger was only one off the lead proudly held by McDowell. 
As for the hard-working Chris Moore, it's been a successful and enjoyable first day of the championship. A wonderful day. I was so pleased to see the competition, the championship, actually underway. We couldn't be more happy that there's so many people here and moving around the course happily. And with good scores, uh, some good scores under par, a number which are over par, and I think the course has held up well despite the early rain. Day two. Of the Open Championship. The busiest day of the week. With an estimated 50,000 spectators. It's the last chance. To watch all 156 players. Before the cut. Once again, the wind farm wasn't about to gather a bumper harvest. The beach looked especially welcoming as the mercury rocketed. Although not quite to the unprecedented levels earlier in the week. It was wonderful for sunbathers but not for those intent on fire prevention. It was actually a quite a live issue on Tuesday and Wednesdays when we had temperatures over 100 degrees, but nevertheless we're uh, exercising due caution all around. Merseyside Fire Brigade have two uh, of their main engines here and a team, so if anything was to happen, they're absolutely on site and could react quickly. Parched and susceptible, Fire units were present, but thankfully no problems were encountered throughout the week. As a member of the Sunshine Tour in South Africa, Richard Sturney felt right at home in the heat, especially on the par 3 15th. Sterney's fellow countryman, Retief Goosen, was also enjoying the tropical weather. And many believed the twice US Open champion would be a significant threat. But thrust into a familiar role, the man most licensed to thrill was Tiger Woods. Teeing off early, the Californian was quickly into his stride combining accuracy from the tee with a warm putter. The game face was painted on, and those hoping to catch a glimpse of something extra special on the dogleg 14th would not be disappointed. And after yet again erring on the side of caution by laying well back off the tee, it was there that Tiger, this time employing a four iron, struck a marvel of a shot that resonated around the world. And while Tiger was entertaining the crowds on the links, earlier in the week, another larger-than-life American was top of the bill in nearby Liverpool city centre. The last time the Open was played at Hoylake, the Beatles, who'd started their career in the Cavern Club, had just released Sergeant Pepper. With echoes of the swinging 60s everywhere, John Daly, the 1995 Open champion, was excited to perform there. It's like everybody else, you know, it's more of a hobby of me, mine playing it and writing, but I collect guitars and jerseys more than anything, and it's awesome. I mean, you know, you look at these walls and you look at the back of the T-shirts and all the greatest artists and bands that have ever played music have been here, and, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And, you know, there's a lot of history in Memphis, but uh, not like this bar right here. All the greatest have played here.
For most of the second round, Daly had pretty good rhythm, but I'm afraid the 18th brought the blues. Twice out of bounds, he recorded a treble bogey eight and sadly wasn't around at the weekend. Several other former Open champions saw their participation limited to 36 holes as well. Among them, US Ryder Cup captain Tom Lehman, who followed a vintage 68 with a 77. One of Friday's biggest moves was achieved by a player who's been very close to winning a major without quite pulling it off. America's Chris DeMarco, beaten in a playoff at the 2004 US PGA and 2005 Masters. He shot a 65 to reach nine under par. In terms of pure imagination, Jim Furyk produced one of the shots of the week with this dinky putt from the bunker. Helping him to finish five under par and firmly in the hunt. But while every one of the 156 players contributed to the story, the headlines belonged to Tiger. He shot 65 for 12 under par. Only bettered by the 130 aggregate from Nick Faldo at Muirfield in 1992 on the list of low 36 hole totals in the Open. As you might imagine, Woods thoroughly enjoyed himself. It's just a fun way to play golf. We don't get a chance to play golf like this. You got to be creative and you got to uh, really understand how to control your ball. There are plenty of opportunities out there. As Tiger wrapped up another fruitful day, Ernie Els set off and was fully aware of the importance of keeping Tiger firmly in his sights. If he's 12 under, there's some birdies to be made out there, you know, so I, I felt I had to get my share of them. He's quite a good front runner. <laughs> you need to kind of reach out and haul him back, you know, it'll be very tough to do, but uh, you need to get close to him. definite target at which to aim, and motivated by a desire to regain the claret jug after his victory in 2002, Els played beautifully. An early birdie on the third established the tone, as the South African, who won the Tillman Trophy as a pencil-thin teenager around these links in 1988, made a positive statement by matching Tiger's 65. Good cause, Ernie was content. I'm playing nicely. I, um, obviously, after the 65, you feel quite confident, and my injury is something of the past now. And you know, I've done the work, and I just want to try and play as good as I can over the weekend. Woods accompanied by Els in the third round, a mouth-watering prospect, with much class a little lower down, fiercely determined to overshadow the big two. The third day of the Open Championship. It's called moving day. As players jostle for position. Ahead of the final day's drama. Regardless of the end result, it was already a proud week for Australian golf, with an unprecedented 23 players teeing off in the championship. What a fitting venue to break that record, because it was right here, 50 years ago, that Peter Thompson won the third of his five Open titles. And on the golden anniversary of that triumph, the great man returned to relive those wonderful memories. Welcome to Hoylake. Thank you. Very Thank lovely you. to see you again. Lovely to be back. Thank you. Fantastic. Good. 50 years ago was a long way back. But uh, as I'm here, I can get the same feeling I got then. And that, that's one of, I suppose, exhilaration, because th this is a, a very sacred place for golf. In 1956, Thompson won his third successive Open. Half a century later, he was afforded a tribute by the club. Thompson also had an ambassadorial role, offering advice and encouragement to his compatriots, who started out on Thursday dreaming of emulating his success. 
Mm. I think I kissed you 50 years ago. <laughs> None of these boys were born or even thought of when I was playing here at Hoylake. Uh, I think Jeff Ogilvy is our best hope. He's more likely to win than any of the others uh, because of the way he plays, uh, his uh, coolness and his beautiful swing and rhythm. And I think they're the things that uh, one must have to be a, a real champion. Ogilvy was one of ten Australians who made the cut. He's given his compatriots collective belief that they can transport the claret jug down under for the first time since Greg Norman at Royal St George's in 1993. We've spoken to a lot of them about Jeff Ogilvy's win at the US Open and they've, to a man, said that's inspired them and kicked them on a bit. But this has always been the tournament that Aussies have inspired to, you know, we still uh, have a bit of a love-hate relationship. We don't have the ashes, we'd like to have the claret jug. It's a good opportunity for them and, uh, of course, they want to win it. About 15% of the field is pretty good. I'm, I'm very happy with that. I know everyone involved with Australian golf is happy about that. I'd just like to see one of them go out there and do it. They've got to beat a, beat a pretty uh, tough guy in Tiger Woods. But it would certainly mean something considering Jeff has just won the last major. So two in a row would be something special. There was no double for Ogilvy. He eventually finished his championship alongside Aussie Brett Rumford in a tie for 16th. After a third round 70, Adam Scott did remain in contention, sharing eighth and harboring big ambitions for the final round. And John Senden, who only secured his place at Hoylake by winning in America the previous weekend, won't forget his dash across the Atlantic. The second hole in one of the championship, this time on the 13th. Cheers were ringing out across the course, and not only for the Australians. Japan's Hidito Tanahara was also in the groove. Starting out four under par, he was swiftly into his stride, shooting 33 on the front nine. The most telling forward progress, though, was made by Sergio Garcia. began on the second. Nine iron, perfection. An eagle two and more was to come. Even when he was faced with what appeared to be an escape blocking lie on the fourth, Garcia's magic did the trick. Gathering momentum, the highest place European in the world rankings astoundingly reached the turn in 29, thanks to an eagle and four birdies. <laughs> Suddenly, he was on Tiger's tail. And yet this wasn't a one-man show, because Garcia's playing partner, Jim Furyk, was also going well. The super-consistent American couldn't quite replicate Garcia's front nine heroics, but he did go out in 31, mustering four birdies of his own. For the multitude who'd again flocked to Royal Liverpool, it was difficult to imagine anything better. Hospitable weather, golf of the very highest standard, and the opportunity to indulge in a spot of light refreshment before Ernie Els and Tiger Woods stepped onto the first tee at 2.30. Golfing tails were swapped, scoreboards were scanned, the big screen again had magnetic qualities, and diets were temporarily suspended for lunch at the Open. But few meals or beverages can compete with the lure of watching Tiger in action, whether through technological advancement from a whole variety of angles on television or in the flesh. 
As it turned out, the Woods Ells shootout didn't fire to life in the early stages, as Woods bogeyed the second after Ells had begun inauspiciously himself by dropping a shot at the first. While Ells stayed pretty much on the back foot, Tiger remained calm, birdied the fifth, then underlined just how sweetly he was swinging his mid-irons with a tee shot from heaven on the ever-demanding sixth. The putt fell just, and Woods improved to one under for the day, 13 under for the championship. In recent times, Tiger has been a little unpredictable with his driver. He consciously shied away from it at Hoylake, but Chris DeMarco wasn't perturbed by seeking maximum length, and that bold philosophy helped him to a round of 69. With his unconventional trademark claw putting grip, DeMarco was finding the hole with regularity. It had already been a frustrating season as he slowly regained full fitness following a skiing accident. But, much worse, was trying to overcome the death of his mother, Norma, who'd passed away on July the 4th and left the family devastated. I've been extremely lucky because I've had an overwhelming amount of support. It's helped tremendously, and obviously playing good is helping, it's therapeutic. I know there was divine intervention out there today. My mom's name was Norma, and I got on the first tee, and the scorer, her name was Norma. And as soon as I introduced myself, I got goosebumps. I told my caddy, I said, she's right there with us. I know she is. So I've got somebody up there on my side tomorrow that's going to be looking over me. The 1967 champion, Di Vincenzo, was unable to make the trip back to the scene of his greatest triumph. But octogenarian Roberto was at home, watching intently as another easy-going Argentine, Angel Cabrera, came home in 32 for a third round 66 that placed him only two behind the leader. Here's a man with open credentials, having only missed the playoff at Carnoustie in 1999 by a single shot. But what of the fortunes of young Garcia, who made his open debut as a 16-year-old in 1996? Well, his approach play on the back nine was at times outstanding. But his putter cooled and several birdie opportunities were wasted. He did, though, pick up another shot with a tap in on the par 5 18th, kept a bogey off his card and signed for a 65 one better than Saturday companion Furyk. Both left the course prepared to be back in the thick of things next day. I was very pleased uh, the way I played all day long. Uh, I felt like uh, I struck the ball very nicely. And today was a thrill with the people and all the cheers uh, coming into the greens was just amazing. Back out on the course, a much needed birdie at the ninth balanced the books for Ernie Els who went out in 35 with no real fireworks. The same number of shots were required for Tiger to cover the front nine. In truth, an average day for the overnight leaders, expected in many quarters to run away from the rest. The back nine saw little improvement. Ells bogeyed the 13th, but birdies at the closing par fives, the 16th and the 18th, enabled the three-time major champion to keep thinking about the possibility of claiming number four. Woods is normally such an unstoppable front runner that his mistakes coming home were a shock. All things considered, it was a very un-Tiger-like performance, particularly on the greens. He was left to rue a trio of three putts and wonder how costly they might prove to be. Mind you, he did birdie two of the last three holes for a 71 and 13 under. 
It was the 11th time that Woods had led a major championship heading into the final round, and on every one of the previous 10 occasions, he'd staved off the challengers to triumph. Would that 100% record remain intact at Hoylake? Only if putting kinks were ironed out. Hopefully tomorrow I can just putt a little bit better, because if I putted just normal today and take away my three putts, um, you know, I'm, I'm shoot four and apart today. Well, Sergio played beautifully today, and uh, tomorrow it'll be it'll be fun for both of us to go out there and try and win the Open Championship. But uh, it's not just Sergio and myself, I and mean, there are a bunch of guys up there. So, uh, you know, and we, we got our, our work cut out for us tomorrow. What a Sunday to savor. The inability of Woods and Elves to pull away meant that only five shots separated the top 15 players, with only two shots covering the top six. As for Tiger, using his driver only once in 54 holes, that was a tactic Peter Thompson appreciated and understood fully. None of these championships are won by accident. Somebody arriving and they haven't got any hope of winning, it doesn't happen like that. It, the ones, even the ones that are long shots, have some kind of plan in their head that they follow. And I think that's what's so necessary. A ringing endorsement from a man with a deep knowledge of the Open's demands. Welcome to the final day's action. Little in sport can compare... ..with the drama and the tension... ..of the final round of the Open Championship. By the end of today, another worthy champion will be crowned. Bringing the Open back to Hoylake proved an undeniable success, but it did present a series of planning challenges. Logistics of a modern-day championship are far removed from those back in 1967, when the total attendance for the entire week was slightly fewer than 30,000. Less than any single day of the 2006 event. Royal Liverpool Golf Club, Wirral Council and the RNA were essentially forced to work from a blank canvas. One of the big problems was the infrastructure needs of 2006 are massively different from the infrastructure needs of 1967. A new venue is a challenge, which is good for all of us. But on the other hand, you know, what, what we're trying to do is to take a footprint from one venue to another. So there are certain aspects of the championship that we just have to have. Uh, certain tents for public catering, etc. Uh, a certain number of grandstand seats. So we did have a, an annual footprint to work to. We've been able to provide space on our municipal course Finding um, the necessary traffic plans to accommodate everybody coming and going, and just trying to make sure that everybody can get here without waiting too long so people can enjoy what they've come for, which is to see the golf, see the players, and enjoy the sunshine. One of the most essential cogs for any open championship is public transportation to and from the course. This year, spectators had the choice of an adapted railway service from Liverpool city centre or instead using the park and ride. With a huge bus fleet moving thousands of people on any championship day, it was the largest such service ever provided for at an Open. And it came through with flying colours. Having identified the best pieces of ground uh, for the parking facilities, I think we've got about 120 buses working uh, to bring people in. And some people who've never been on a bus in their life have said it's been fantastic. <laughs> Regardless of exactly how they arrived, the crowds for the final round were eager to soak up the atmosphere on what promised to be a day of high drama. Around midday, the leaders also started to surface, in ample time to fine-tune their respective games before the heat of competition. The defending champion checked in early and marched straight to the putting green for an intensive practice session on the three footers that had eluded him during the tail end of round three. While the main men were applying the final touch to their preparations, trying to slip into an unshakable zone of concentration, the rest of the field was supplying an engrossing warm-up. It hadn't been the most productive open for the home nations, but Paul Broadhurst gave those around the 10th green something to cheer. Yeah. 
Anthony Wall was also going well and hoping to post an early clubhouse score. An unlikely birdie on the third did his cause no harm. When the leaders finally got underway, it was with trouble at the opening holes. Jim Furyk trod water. He bogeyed the first and slipped even further back by repeating that error on the second. Learning that you find Hoylegs bunkers at your peril. Also struggling on the first, Chris DeMarco, having found deep rough from the tee, partly caused by the adrenaline of the moment. Being in contention in a major is like a drug. Like, I mean, it is so awesome to be playing well when everything is on the line. It is, as a player, it is the best thing in the world. But falling victim to a bogey on the first isn't a good feeling, and DeMarco needed this to salvage par. Marco retreats to 11 under, now two behind Woods, just embarking on his final round. <laughs> Tiger has many strengths, none more so than his unswerving focus from the very first hole. I believe in the way I play golf that you turn a switch on a first hole and you have it on the entire time and you don't try any harder on each and every shot. Um, you have the same effort level, you give it everything you have on every shot. Almost robotic in that oh-so-clinical outlook, pulls apart from Garcia, who rides a wave of emotion and won't disguise his feelings. His round off and running with a drive that merited no complaints. The eagerly anticipated duel had commenced, accompanied by the traditional media entourage, along for the afternoon. Garcia retained sufficient nerve to par the first. Yeah! But would Tiger's pre-round toil on the practice green pay off? A positive start. Following a par on the first, Cabrera was stopped in his tracks on the second. When he left the green with a treble bogey seven, the big man from Cordoba, with bundles of support, knew that any title aspirations had effectively been snuffed out. But there was cheerier news for fellow Argentine Andreas Romero. In the championship, after finishing tied second in the Scottish Open at Loch Lomond seven days earlier. The 25-year-old European Tour rookie, who aptly won the Roberto Di Vincenzo Classic in his homeland last year, made his presence felt with three birdies in a row from the fourth. Fueled by that burst, Romero climbed to 11 under par, only two behind Woods, who registered another safe and sure par on the second. Garcia, meanwhile, was added to a lengthy list of those who couldn't get to grips with that second hole after missing a short par putt. He was then presented with another shortly after at the third. The raw pressure of Open Championship Sunday is guaranteed to expose any frailty. Garcia had lost two shots in three holes. Cracks were beginning to appear. In stark contrast, Woods was the epitome of self-control and discipline as he put together a sequence of four straight untroubled pars. The only other member of the leading group with identical figures for the first four holes was Ernie Els. And on the fifth, the friendly 36-year-old with almost 60 worldwide titles on his CV had a birdie putt to catch his great rival. A tie at the top. Back down the fairway of the 528-yard par 5, 
Woods was conscious of that development. The hole had been to Tiger's liking with a birdie on each of the first three days, and another was highly desirable. Although his body language suggested otherwise, Woods had struck a perfect approach to the heart of the green, and was now thinking not of a mere birdie, but an eagle three in order to lead by two. It was quite a response. Refusing to be flustered by his bogey on the first, DeMarco regrouped with four pars before setting up a gilt-edged birdie chance on the not-so-short par 3 sixth. Sink that, and he'd climb to within one of the lead. As he's shown numerous times in the past, tenacity is second nature. But one common factor linking all great champions is the priceless knack of raising their game at precisely the right moment. When it was required, Woods delivered an eagle on the fifth. I kept telling myself uh, that you know, basically only Ernie and I have, have won this championship. And I just think that um, there's a certain calmness that comes about being able to say with honesty that you know, I've done this before. And when I'm out there, and that's uh, the calmness that I feel. You know, he's got a, an uncanny ability to, when somebody gets close to him, to just turn it up another level. And, you know, he does it the best in the world. That's why he's number one in the world. Woods, two under for the day, 15 under in total. And his overnight lead doubled thanks to one exceptionally played hole. For now, Els and DeMarco repelled. Up ahead on the 18th green, the gargantuan grandstands were already near capacity as Anthony Wall put the finishing touches to a four birdie, one bogey round of 69 that, when the dust settled, would transport the Londoner into a tie for 11th and ensure he was the leading Brit. Deserved a claim. And a few minutes later, Carl Peterson likewise closed with a birdie to share the clubhouse lead at nine under. Fast improving Swede, bettered par in three out of four rounds. It was now, for players and spectators alike, a case of scrambling for position. But around the turn, it proved heavy going for Tiger's chasers. Els collected his first bogey of the day at the eighth and disappointingly failed to birdie the tenth. DeMarco did, though, and jumped into second spot by moving to 13 under. As for Tiger, it was business as usual. Finding the fairways and greens in regulation to make pars at six, seven, eight, and nine before answering DeMarco's birdie at the reachable par five tenth. As a result, the 30-year-old golfing superman forged three shots clear. Els, realizing something special was an absolute must, did press on the deceptively testing 11th and only succeeded in dropping another shot. With it, his hopes of victory were effectively extinguished. After that, the sole challenger was DeMarco, who refused to buckle, having also found the 11th quite a handful. Marco followed that spirited par with another at the consistently difficult 12th, but Woods stuck at 16 under, and with only seven holes to negotiate, remained three to the good. Woods is no stranger to the never-say-die attitude of DeMarco that was again exhibited on the 13th. A chink of light, maybe, if that could be holed.
Almost simultaneously, Woods, flawless till then, committed a rare mistake from an ideal location on the 12th fairway. For once, not the desired shape. Green missed, and approximately 300 yards away, DeMarco settled over his birdie attempt. Maybe, just maybe, DeMarco's persistence was paying off. He now trailed by only two. Twelfth, Woods was faced with an up and down to examine any short game maestro. Made a fair fist of it, but the expression spoke volumes. Tiger couldn't avoid a bogey. Just like that, his seemingly unassailable three-shot lead was cut to a single stroke. Japan would celebrate as Tanahara made an uncommon three on the 14th to reach 11 under. While at the 16th, Adam Scott weighed in with his sixth birdie of a roller coaster round. At no point, though, did he ever threaten to emulate Peter Thompson's triumph in 1956. And, with all due respect, they were now out of the frame, as Woods and DeMarco made almost certain that America's recent domination of the Open would continue. The big question remaining, though, was which of the two players would be carrying the claret jug back over the Atlantic. After a far from straightforward par on the 13th, Woods tackled the 14th and its tempting right-hand pin placement. Anything even marginally erring to the right gathers into a deep, often punishing hollow. But as he did at the 5th, Tiger passed the test of character with honours. Looking the picture of calmness, it was no surprise he rolled in another timely birdie. His two-shot lead and momentum restored, Tiger walked onto the 15th tee and, with the eyes of the sporting world trained on him, delved even deeper. <laughs> Woods looking every inch a champion. But with his father and son adding to his already substantial support, DeMarco remained stubborn and birdied the 16th to reduce the lead once more to just one shot. Yet, try as he might, and to his enormous credit, no one could possibly have tried any harder, DeMarco's resistance was simply not enough. Calm in the world, Tiger converted his birdie at the 15th to restore his two-shot lead. And after tapping in for his third successive birdie at the relatively easy par 5 16th, Woods was now three shots clear and confident of becoming the first back-to-back -back Open champion since Tom Watson in 1983. After a sustained challenge, DeMarco and Ells received an especially warm reception at the 18th. But they were resigned to the fact that, yet again, Tiger had burned brighter than anyone else. Second place, his third in a major, was already secure, but professional pride was key, as DeMarco, now runner-up in the Open, Masters and USPGA, sealed a back nine of 33 in a round of 68 with a birdie. Victory may have eluded the American, but in the wake of a family tragedy, his display was both commendable and courageous. I know my mom would be very proud of me right now. Um, one, for playing well, but two, just because that's how she was. And this doesn't change anything, it doesn't make any, it just makes it a little more therapeutic. It just, it just helps knowing that I know she was a big part of it out there today.
After cranking out another par at the penultimate hole, Woods knew the championship was won, and his joyous passage up the 18th was a victory parade. His strategy, questioned by some, had been well and truly vindicated. I developed a strategy to play this golf course that I thought suited me and, and I felt comfortable with it. And I went out there and executed my game plan. Probably one of the best ball striking weeks I've ever had. With thousands of fans and his wife Ellen there to share the moment, Woods quietly and unspectacularly completed the task and one of his most satisfying wins. Par five saw him finish 18 under, only one shot outside his record 19 under winning total at St Andrews in 2000. But this wasn't about statistics. It was all about emotion, unleashed when the realization struck that his objective had indeed been accomplished. When he and caddy Steve Williams embraced, tears flowed. I guess all the things that uh, we've gone through uh, of late, and uh, I guess I'm kind of the one who kind of bottles things up a little bit, but at that moment, it just came pouring out of, of all the things that um, you know, my father has meant to me in, in, in the game of golf, and I just wish he could have seen it one more time. In the end, Woods won by two, claiming his third open, but first at a venue other than the old course. It was his 11th major, tying another Hoylake champion, Walter Hagen, for second on the list, seven adrift of Jack Nicklaus. With a score of 270, the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Tiger Woods. Woods, supremely confident, Steadfast in the manner he tackled Hoylake had come good. It was a performance of which his father would have been extremely proud, and one that everyone associated with Royal Liverpool Golf Club will recall for many years to come. I guess walking on the last hole here, uh, I got a chance to, to enjoy this one a little bit, and then um, on the last after my last putt, uh, you know, I realized that uh, you know, my dad's never going to see this again. And um, I, I wish he could have seen this one last time. I, I tried at Augusta and it didn't happen. But uh, he was out there today keeping me calm. I love my dad and I miss him very much. Bernard Darwin once wrote, Hoy Lake blown upon by mighty winds, breeder of mighty champions. There are none mightier than Tiger.